Hi booktube, this is Kelly. Thank you so much for watching my channel, Books I'm Not Reading. I am here today with uh, my third video in my Pulitzer Prize uh, series, uh, 1918 to 2020, because the uh, 2021 winner will be announced in June this year. Um, if you stumbled across this video and you have not watched the introduction to this series, I'm going to link to it down below and I would just really encourage you to watch that before you watch this particular video. I also made a video that I'll link down below. It's about why I decided to read all the books that have won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction or as it was previously known, the Pulitzer Prize for the novel. So. <clears throat> Having said that, today we're going to talk about the worst. Now, it's really easy to just go crazy and hate on books, but all of these books um, at one time or by some of you are still considered great American novels. Um, and you know what? That's fine. That's totally fine. This was my experience of reading them. Keep in mind, I read most of these books, not all, but most of these books between 2007 and uh, the beginning of 2010. So it's been a while. I had to go through my, my uh, defunct blog um, to see what my initial impressions and reactions were to the books. So having said that, I'd like to start off with a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, Jennifer Egan, A Visit from the Goon Squad. Uh, she wins the prize for worst chapter uh, in Pulitzer history. And I bet you already know what I'm talking about because there's a chapter of this book that is done in PowerPoint. And I heard about it even before I'd read the book and I just, oh God, like, <laughs> I mean, it's not a great chapter anyway. Maybe somebody like Douglas Copeland who writes about like the tech sort of world could have pulled it off, but I just think it was a poor use of a, a program that eventually will become obsolete and replaced by something else. And then there's gonna have to be some sort of footnote in her book about what PowerPoint was. And I, I just, yeah, it, it almost struck me as a bit um, gimmicky. However, it is not among the worst books to win the Pulitzer Prize, in my opinion. Again, this is all my opinion. Another honorable mention. So this book, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, it did not win the Pulitzer Prize. Now, as I've said previously, I um, there's much, much more information about the finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. The, I think there's been 10 years where no a prize was given, including this year, which was 1974. But this was the only book I knew about at the time that I was doing the Pulitzer Project that I knew um, had been recommended for the Pulitzer and was refused. Um, and the Pulitzer board dismissed the book as unreadable, turgid, overwritten, and obscene. And at the time about the Pulitzer Project, I felt that was very like unfair. Why have a fiction committee if you're not going to take their recommendation? Um, and uh, so I sort of read it as like a form of protest, maybe. Um, I it was it was horrible though. I hated it. I hated it. Um, uh, I read, I tried to read a companion guide with the book. I tried to read information online to understand some of the things that were happening or why Pynchon, who seems like a smart guy, um, but why he would, why he would write just such awful, awful things. Like, I mean, uh, his portrayal of women was particularly disturbing to me. There's that's with the exception of one uh, character, but all of the other women in the book are raped, abused, um, tortured, and they seem to want it. Um, a woman urinates and defecates into another person's mouth. They're in cages. Um, there is a, a terrible, terrible uh, scene involving an 11-year-old girl. And 
that's why this is one of the worst books I've ever read. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm torn because I feel like if you're gonna have a fiction committee make recommendations, then you should listen to them. But at the same time, <laughs> I was just really hated this book. And those of you who are trying to read all the books who have won the Pulitzer Prize, if you have not read this, I would, I would say don't. I would say skip it, but that's just me. <laughs> all right, the next one, and this is another honorable mention. This book I'm gonna nominate as the Pulitzer that I did not get. Um, this is House Made of Dawn by N. Scott Mamaday. Um, he is the only Native American writer to win the Pulitzer Prize. Shame on you, Pulitzer Committee, because there have been many, many great uh, contenders for the Pulitzer Prize by Native American authors. Um, and I think my number one choice would be Louise Erdrich. Um, I really, really hope that she wins a Pulitzer at some point in her life. Um, anyway, so this, um, he is a member of the, the Kiwa tribe and um, this one in 1969. This is, I think, the only time uh, during the Pulitzer Project that I, I found a spark notes of House Made of Dawn and tried to use that. It's like a, like a Cliff Notes kind of book. Um, I had complete minimal understanding of um, the, what the characters said, what the characters did. Uh, I actually picked this book for my Pulitzer Prize winning book club and only two people showed up. One person had DNF to the book. The other person had finished it. And so we decided to tell her like what happens in the book. And this is how the conversation would go. I would say, well, then this character did da 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 da. And the other person would go, really? Like, I didn't see that, like that happened? And then the other person would tell, this person who hadn't read the book, um, well, after that, then such and such happens. And uh, and I'm like, oh, that happened? Did that happen in the book? I mean, he he takes things in the present moment and, and moves to the past or or it's almost like a hallucination. Um, and I just, I just couldn't follow the story. I'm hoping it's because Mama Day is just so much smarter than I am. But uh, yeah, so I really struggled with it. Um, I think this book started off as poetry and then short stories and then a novel and that could be part of the problem. However, I will say that Mom Day um, and this book is given credit for starting sort of a renaissance um, among Native American writers like James Welch, totally should have won a Pulitzer Prize, um, Leslie Marmon Silko, Sherman Alexie, um, and both Louise Erdrich and Linda Hogan um, have been finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. I didn't look and see, but there have been plenty of other people who, who should have been contenders. So, all right, now let's get into the worst, the worst books in the Pulitzer Prize. Let's start off with a Pulitzer that I could not get. Um, this is Conrad Richter's The Town. And... <clears throat> this is part of the Awakening Land series. Um, Richter won this, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1951. So it is part of a trilogy. Um, the first two books are um, The Trees, which I later have, you know, since learned that The Trees was a finalist for the Pulitzer. Um, so it's The Trees, The Fields, and then The Town. Um, and this is about um, the development of Ohio. Uh, it was very strange for me living in the West and thinking of Ohio as like there being pioneers there, <laughs> that sort of thing. So um, it follows uh, the character Sayward Luckett Wheeler. Um, so in the first book, The Tree, she's a young girl um, and the book follows her up. Um, by the time we get to the town, she, um, uh, in spite of her harsh life growing up, she's become a wealthy landowner. I, I think I think the Pulitzer Committee maybe gave Richter this book 
because it's the weakest of the three, but maybe collectively, like for the whole the whole trilogy. My real problem with the town and the fields and the trees is that its portrayal of Native Americans is so unbelievably racist. Um, it is off the charts. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, unfortunately, the Pulitzer Prize winners are riddled with racism. Uh, and it can be really hard to tell whether an author is giving a character racist, a, a ra giving a character a racist um, outlook on life, or whether the author themselves is a racist. Um, but and and it, there's there's definitely definitely other books that I found incredibly racist. Um, Let's see, I want to say um, Honey and the Horn uh, and I think it's The Travels of Jamie McFeeders also come to mind, especially, again, for their portrayal of Native Americans. But that one, it just like, it really tipped the scales in how I felt about the whole series and um, it was just, um, it was just unforgivable to me. So. That's my feeling there. All right, the next one. The Mambo Kings Play Songs of Love by Oscar Huelos. This book won in 1990. At the time, again, I didn't know what the finalists were that year, um, that at the time I was reading this, um, but uh, I just couldn't believe that there wasn't anything better in American literature that year. Found that extremely hard to believe. Uh, it turns out um, E.L. Doctorow's Billy Bathgate, I have not read that, but that was a finalist um, in 1990. And this follows two brothers, Caesar and Nestor Castillo, um, who moved to New York um, in the 1950s and become part of the golden era of the Mambo. Um, they um, make an appearance on the I Love Lucy show and they perform their most famous song which is called Beautiful Maria of My Soul. Okay, after a hundred pages, a hundred pages of this book, I was so sick of reading about these two brothers' sex life. Um, their descriptions of women, moist vaginas, nice round rumps, bulging breasts, but mostly I was disgusted by the frequent descriptions of Caesar's pinga. Um, the author tells us over and over how huge it is, how it hangs down to his knees, and how it thrusts and pumps and grinds again and again. Later in Caesar's life, Huelos feels it necessary to tell us three times that in his old age, Caesar's sex organ, that's how it's described in the book, okay, <laughs> has become lackadaisical. He uses the word lackadaisical three times in relation to this, but that it's still enormous. Um, and even there's a scene in this book where a character is dying and, and what all they can think of is um, the women that they didn't get to sleep with. Come on, come on. Um, there were glimpses of some lovely writing, times when I could see an author who was trying to capture this moment of American history, um, but I really, I just wanted it to be over with. <laughs> If you love John Updike, like lucky you, man. Like he wrote more than 60 books in his life. There's short stories, um, all kinds of things. So uh, he's just not, he's just not my jam. Like that's awesome. If you love Updike, great. <laughs> but for me, uh, it was, I just, I just spent too much time in this world. So you can see how big this book is, which is two books, um, and these are the two that won the Pulitzer. Rabbit is Rich, which won, let's see, in, oh, I didn't, I didn't write it down, um, and Rabbit at Rest, which won in 1991. Um, so, but before this is Rabbit Run, and um, and then Rabbit Redux. So I had this and then another book 
about the same size and I'd, I'd read all of it because really like can you read the last two books in a series and not the two books that come before it and I just didn't really feel like I could especially because it's it's clearly the same character that we're following along which is Harry Angstrom um, he was a, a, a basketball player in high school that everyone really loved um, and the first book Rabbit Run I was actually surprised when I looked back on my initial impression of it and that, you know, like I felt like there were some redeemable things about it. The ending kind of surprised me a little bit. So yeah, and, and Harry Ingstrom is 24 in the first book. So it follows, it follows his adult life basically with these series. Um, uh, he's 36 in Rabbit Redux, which is the second book. His apathy and moral spinelessness uh, is, you know, I mean, we see it kind of from the beginning, but it was really in Rabbit Redux, it is just very much in your face. I really feel like Uptight could have made us care in, in, in this much, I mean, even just these two books, right? Like, we could have cared about Harry Angstrom. I just didn't really. I didn't really care about him. So by the time we get to the Pulitzers, um, so Rabbit is rich, he's successful. He like co-owns like a, I think a car dealership with maybe his wife who's finally back together again with has a lot of things that, you know, you expect him to want. And, but he's, he's still not happy. Um, he's scared that the only person that he's ever gonna sleep with again in his life is his wife, you know. <sighs> And then we get to Rabbit at Rest, right? So again, you like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I had like, like a thimble full of empathy for Harry <laughs> by the time we get to Rabbit at Rest. His, his, he's got heart problems. His, I think his son is, is trying to take care of him. Uh, his wife wants to work. I, I don't, yeah. Um, anyway, like I said, it's been, it's been a long time since I've read these books, but I just, I think I spent too much time with Harry Ingstrom and, and Updike, even though Updike definitely um, can write a, a really powerful, beautiful sentence um, here and there, like it, I didn't feel any empathy. And I think that's kind of a running theme of these things that are what I consider to be the worst Pulitzers is that I just don't care about the characters. The other reason why I really am upset at Rabbit at Rest winning, and again, I think this is another case where the Pulitzer Committee gave Updike the wins for these, is for the whole series. Um, Rabbit at Rest, the two finalists that year, uh, one of them was Linda Hogan for Mean Spirit, which I haven't read, but I want to, but the other finalist, is The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is one of the best books I've ever read. And this book totally deserves a Pulitzer, totally. So, ugh. all right, enough of Updike. And, and again, congrats to those of you who, who love him. All right. The next book, and you can't see the hideous cover because um, I had to get this on interlibrary loan. So I'll try to block that out there. This is The Store by T.S. Stribling. I won the Pulitzer in 1933. So I had to read, this is again part of a trilogy, and before this one I read um, The Forge. Um, it is about the Biden family, I don't know if I'm saying that right, in Alabama. Um, the Forge starts on the first day of the Civil War. Um, the store starts 20 years, um, I think, since the Civil War. So, <sighs> I, I was actually really surprised by The Forge. Um, when I read it, I was like, oh, maybe this, maybe the store won't be quite so bad. Like, it still felt fresh. Like, it still felt like it had something to say. Whereas this focuses on one of the characters from uh, The Forge that I didn't really like. His name is... Milt, Milt, well, they call him Milt, okay? Milt a day, Milt, Milt a days, Biden. Uh, he's described as somebody who is basically a, a sociopath. Laundry, sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, 
it was just one sad event after another. And, you know, again, like everyone's so crooked um, that I just didn't feel any sympathy for anybody in the book. The third book in this series is called Unfinished Cathedral. And no, I didn't read it. <laughs> All right, and finally we get to the last one. A great cover here. This is Guard of Honor by James Gold Cousin Cousins, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1949. Okay, so when I read this book, and obviously it wasn't this one, but there was a, it had a dust jacket, and there was this cover, or, or blurb, excuse me, on the cover about how this was the World War II book. The world, like there was Catch Twenty Two, there was the Cane Mutiny, um, some other things were mentioned, but like no, like this, this was the book about World War Two, and I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, it was my expectations were high, and I think that's maybe part of the problem, maybe why I hated it so much. But, um. Uh, it was 631 pages of absolute agony. Um, and I had to just keep telling myself the entire time I read this book to just keep reading 10 more pages. Just keep going. Um, because, yeah, it was um, terrible. This book takes place in Florida over three days. One of those days, I think, takes place on a flight. Uh, there are um, a whole bunch of characters. There are not connected really it's so disjointed i mean there's just a bunch of people and they do stuff but it's not doesn't affect any you know somebody else or whatever um it, it's mainly about characters pushing paper uh, a lot of it um <laughs> in my blog i wrote i could describe some of the events of the book for you but the only thing that holds them together is that they take place in florida over three days um he tells so many stories um, by at the end they all become meaningless um, and you know the only thing I can think of is that maybe Cousins wanted us to consider the people who are working for the war effort in the states but it was yeah tragically boring and and that blurb man it really really set me up for um, a major disappointment so those are the books that I consider to be among the worst. If you've read them, like if you've read any of them, tell me about them. Tell me what you think. Um, if I'm so wrong, uh, if I'm, what am I missing? You know, what should have been on my list that isn't? Uh, I look forward to hearing that. Uh, so thank you guys so much for watching. Booktube, remember to be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.